chosen to join us, but please let us know that you are here by commenting or checking in on our Facebook page, and we encourage you to share this service with your friends. Uh, the more people that we can uh, get to hear the message of Jesus Christ through our church, uh, the better. So please uh, share this service with family and friends. If you're present in the sanctuary with us this morning, I encourage you to uh, find the attendance booklet to fill that out and pass that to your neighbor. Uh, that way we can get everyone's attendance registered. Uh, this morning we're going to continue with our sermon. for their word and work, so that Jesus, being lifted up, may draw all people unto him, and the kingdoms of the world may become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, let us turn our attention this morning to the worship of God.
into a time of prayer as well as celebration, I want to invite our online community to please add your own prayer concerns and celebrations to the comment section of this video. Our prayer team not only gets together every week, but we have a running dialogue of where we're constantly sharing burdens and prayer requests, and so we invite you as well. You can email us anytime, prayer at fumcmonticello.org. Several announcements. Um, Brother Brian and myself and several others just returned from annual conference. Uh, we had some great, great worship, reviewed all the things that have happened in the past year, and we are hope-filled for the year ahead. Um, Leanne and Julie will uh, come up with a little uh, report to put in a newsletter to give you a little more uh, details about what all we, we did. Um, but I am very excited to share that Brother Brian and myself have been reappointed to be your pastors here at First Methodist Amen. for another year. Yay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're excited. The youth group is headed to Crenshaw Springs today. Um, it's a district event, and so not only are we going to do the water park, but we're meeting several other youth groups from around our district to have some fellowship, and we're leaving at 1230 today. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you are volunteering as a youth or as an adult helper, we need you in the sanctuary by 8 o'clock tomorrow. I know previously we said 8.30, but let's do 8 o'clock so that um, we've got all our ducks lined up and we know who's helping who and who's going where before the kids get here. If you're not helping us, we ask that you cover us all in prayer. The children, that they may feel the love of God. The adults, as they share Jesus' love. And as we seek to transform our community with more Jesus-filled people. Um, so anyway, that's what's happening this week here at church. Uh, this Saturday, beginning at 8 o'clock, it is Clean Up All Around Church Day. Um, outside and inside cleaning, we need you to bring shovels, hoes, pickaxes, five-gallon buckets. Um, we do need a flatbed trailer to haul away debris if you've got that available. James Tumlison is bringing a cement mixer because we've got several holes in our parking lot that need to be filled in. If you've got another area that you think, hey, we should do this too, let Lynn know and we'll add people to that area as well. Our sole purpose board, thank you so much to all of you that have continued to uh, give donations to help with buying of the shoes and the coats. And thank you to those of you that washed coats this week. You'll notice there's a sign on the door of the previous preschool room that says put the, put the bags of, of clean clothes coats here. Bricks are for sale if you haven't seen uh, the page. We have a prayer garden and a lot of the bricks um, have been given in memory or in honor of different people or families. And so we invite you to be a part of that as well. And so you'll notice on, on the page how to do that. This morning during early worship, we welcome Lily Brazino as a new member. She comes to us by transfer from St. Mark's Catholic Church. And so if you see Lily, be sure and extend to her the right hand of Christian Fellowship. You'll notice on our prayer list, we've got several that are in the hospital. I want to call your attention. Cecile Green had back surgery this past week, and she is recovering well at home. She said her husband and son are feeding her well. Miss Lois Ruff is in the hospital. That is Christine Feltz's mother, and she may be transferred to a different facility this week. Continue to, to pray for her. Miss Mary Emily Calhoun's son is in the hospital and asked for to remember him. He's recovering from pneumonia. And friends, I want to lift up in a special way David Wilkins. Uh, David had a surgery last week on his hip after having a triple bypass the week before, and, um, and he really needs our prayers. So please lift up Mr. David as well as Miss Ginger. Are there other prayer concerns that I have failed to mention? Then let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, you are a God of unity and love. God, place within each one of us a spirit of hope, a spirit of community. Have mercy upon us when we speak without love, when we act without humility. Deliver us from narrow-mindedness, from our bitterness, from our prejudices. God, cleanse us with the living water of your grace, 
and create in us willing hearts to live in patience and gentleness. God, strengthen this church that we may be, a may be a model of ministry and unity for all the world to see. Take us from where we are to where you would have us to be. And make us not merely guardians of a heritage, but living signs of your coming kingdom. Fire us with passion for justice and peace for all people. Raise us up to be your children, growing toward maturity in faith and love. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, make us one. God, we commit to love you, to serve you, and follow you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
invite the ushers to come forward as we get ready to take up our tithes and offering. For our online community, we invite you to give as well. You can email, you can send it in to the church, 317 South Main Street. Come by the church office. Or you can use the gift tab on our FUNC Monticello website. For those of us here, we invite you to give. However the Lord puts it on your heart. As good stewards, we give together so that we can do the ministries of this church. Let's pray. Gracious God, bless the gift and bless the giver. God, use these gifts for your kingdom. Multiply them, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning, number 171, There's Something About That Day. Thank you, and please be seated. As Lori made reference to um, earlier in the service, we are fresh back from uh, annual conference. Uh, this will make my, or did make uh, my 26th year as uh, an annual conference as a, either a licensed local pastor or an ordained elder within. Uh, the United Methodist Church, and 
uh, spent uh, several years uh, prior to that as a child going to, uh, to annual conference. And it's always good to, uh, to see uh, colleagues and friends that uh, have seen throughout the years. It's always a blessing. Uh, but it is also a blessing to be able to, uh, to come home uh, to such a wonderful church as this. And I'm thankful that I get to serve another year in ministry with each and every person uh, within this church and the wonderful staff that we have um, as uh, your senior pastor. Uh, most of you know that I grew up not too far away from here in McGee. Uh, my first church ever was Hermitage. And then I spent time in Star City and in Crossit. Uh, so this was always the church that uh, meetings were held, and I've been in and out of this church for years. So I find myself in certain places, and it's almost like deja vu, something I've been here before many, many times. Uh, this has always been a flagship church of what was the Monticello District and now uh, the Southeast District, and, and look forward to what God has in store for us next in the coming um, as we continue our sermon series uh, this morning on I Believe, Now Tell Me Why, we're going to be looking at how to use and not abuse the Bible. And we're going to be looking at a scripture text that comes out of 2 Timothy. But before I read that, uh, if you will, uh, join me as we go to God in prayer. Oh God, we pray that as scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we can hear with joy all that you have to say to us. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16, in which Paul writes these words to uh, his son and his student in ministry, Timothy. It says, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, in righteousness. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ellen thought that all she needed to do for the day, or all that she needed to know for the day, was in the promise box that she kept at her bedside. When times were tough at work, a promise from the box simply kept her going. If she was facing a difficult decision, the promise box gave her hope and it gave her direction. Even when her husband Jim first became sick, Ellen knew God would heal him because a card from the promise box told her so. Her, her faith never wavered, even as Jim grew worse. When an ambulance took Jim to the hospital, Ellen paused long enough to call her friends at the church, those that were a part of the church's prayer chain, asking them to pray for him. And she was still confident that God would...
close look at Scripture and rebuilt her faith in God and His Word. But there are plenty of of Ellens out there. People who develop their entire set of beliefs through an incomplete use of the Bible. Now, Ellen was not wrong in believing God could heal her husband. She was not wrong in believing that the Bible contains promises for us to claim. Where Ellen never had been married and was single, she did not believe that that's God's word for her. Or maybe like the guy who wanted to find out what God's will was for him, and so he would, he, he devised the plan, and he would open the Bible, and he, the, the passage of scripture that his eyes fell on first, that would be God's will for him. So he did it. And what did he see? Judas went out and hung himself. Surely that was not God's word for him, so let's try it again. You know what he came up with next? Jesus said, go thou and do likewise. We try lots of ways and methods to uh, read the Bible. We try lots of things, but the danger in that type of approach is that it can lead us to read more into the biblical text than what is there. And there is a variation of this belief that Christians use sometimes to oppress people who do not agree with them. It's the belief that the Bible magically holds the specific answer to every possible question that a human being may face. All we have to do is break the Bible's code. And when we do we can discover the hidden message of God that is in there. Earlier Christians, for example, used their creative interpretations of isolated Bible passages to condemn people who said that the earth was not the center of the universe. And it's not that long ago that some used the Bible to argue that God himself had decided African people should be slaves. And people still take scripture out of context to manipulate God into saying what they want to hear. I remember the biblical scholar and professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, Ben Witherington, said that, uh, you know, a text out of context is a pretext for whatever you want it to say. And really, that's what Ellen did, even though she did it unknowingly. So what are we to believe about the Bible? How do we as faithful Christians use but not abuse the Bible? From the Wesleyan perspective or Methodist, the Bible communicates three things. It tells us first, about the nature and character of God. It tells us, secondly, about the nature and the character of human beings. And thirdly, it tells us 
how to respond to God. And this message comes to us in a variety of ways. There's different types of literature written in different periods of history, speaking different languages, using different styles of writing, emphasizing different things. But in the middle of all of this diversity is unity. For the message is directed at those three areas. The nature and character of God, the nature and character of human beings, and how God is calling us to respond to who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do. Now, this understanding of the Bible also implies that there are some things that the Bible is not. Though the Bible speaks about our physical world, the Bible is not a detailed scientific textbook. It tells us that God created the world, but it doesn't tell us how all of it came together, together to being in existence. God spoke, and it was. It's not a detailed science textbook. And though the Bible deals with God's revelation through human history and we find a lot of history and historical figures within the Bible that we can go back and find within our history textbooks, the Bible is not a history textbook. And even though we find the Bible talking about things that are going to be in the future, it does not necessarily give us a detailed account okay, this is going to happen, and here's point B and point C and point D. No, it just tells us that sometime in the future, God is going to reveal himself once again as Jesus descends from the clouds. We don't know what day that is. We don't know when, where. We know how, but it is not intended to answer every single question that we can imagine. But this does not mean that we cut out parts of the Bible because they seem to be irrelevant or because we don't like what they say. We have to take the totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and all of the books in between and learn the story or the theme that is behind it. What is the story of the Bible that connects all of these books together? The most exciting to the most boring. From Leviticus to Deuteronomy to the prophets to whether we understand it, whether we scratch our heads when we read it, whether it doesn't make sense to us right now, all scripture fits together to tell the one story of God and us and how God has chosen to relate to us and how God desires for us to relate to God and to relate to one another. And the Bible doesn't whitewash sin. The Bible tells us story after story after story of people that heard the word of God and said, I'm going to do what I want to do. That knew what God wanted them to do, but did just the opposite. And it tells what they did, and then it tells what happened to them. But on the other hand, the Bible also tells us of individuals that stood in the face of God as he told them, here is who I am, here is who I'm calling you to be, and this person raised their hand and said, sign me up. That sounds like a good thing. I want to live my life in that manner. And we see the fruit and the goodness that that produced. And so we have a whole cacophony of people in the biblical text who either wrote the story or are telling stories about other people, about how God interacted with them. But you know, if we were to look into the lives of the biblical characters, we would see individuals that are no different than we are. No different. 
And the people who wrote the Bible most likely believed that the earth was flat and the sun revolved around the earth. These were common misconceptions in ancient times. They probably had no idea what a dinosaur was or that a fault line in the earth's crust can generate an earthquake. They were ordinary people of faith who lived a, who had and lived with a limited view of the physical world, yet they wrote extraordinary things about God. Why? Because God revealed himself to them in such a way and gave them such an insight that we still are grappling with. We are still talking about the insight that God gave to them. An insight that at the end of the day they probably were wondering where did that come from. Nevertheless, they wrote the story. They told the story of God and of human beings and how God comes to human beings and wants to be in relationship with them. They wrote extraordinary things. And we believe that when they tell us about God, about ourselves, and about how we should relate to God, they are speaking God's truth. In this respect, we can strongly state that the Bible is the trustworthy record of God's revelation, completely truthful in all it affirms. It has been faithfully preserved and it proves itself true in human experience. And if we allow the Bible to become a so that we can know over and over and over again the story of God, the story of us, and how God wants us to relate with him and one another. And when we do this, when we allow this book that is made up of 66 books to be the unifying theme of our life, when we understand the witness of Scripture and the unifying story of Scripture, we will never, ever, be the same. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for this word. But we pray, O oh God, that it will truly be something more than just words, but it will be a transformative word that is spoken into our hearts and into our lives that help us become the people that you have called us to be. As we hear your words over and over again, you are my people, and I am your God, and I have so much that I want to give you, and so much that I want you to understand. I'm calling you to be holy, and this is how I'm calling you to know what it means to look like that. So help us, oh God, to know you in that way. We give you thanks. We give you praise. And we do so in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. My friends, as we come to the communion table this morning, we come not trusting in our own righteousness, but in the manifold and great mercy of God. For truly we are not worthy so as to gather up the crumbs under the table, but God. But God chooses us. 
and God's mercy grants us the grace to be able to come and partake of this sacrament of Jesus Christ so that in our partaking of this sacrament, we may walk in newness of life, may grow into his likeness, and may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your hymnal to page 12 to follow along, otherwise we'll have it, what you need to say on the screen. We want to remind you that this table is open. This is not a United Methodist table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, God gave birth to God's church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for all of us, Jesus, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took a cup. And he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit and us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us be bold as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together. Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy heaven. name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is only one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. My friends, these gifts have been prepared for us by Jesus himself. And he bids us to come and take and eat. And as we do, we are nourished. We are fed. We are then called as we have been nourished and have been fed to go out and to share God's love with the world. Thanks be to God for these gifts and all the gifts that God has given us through Jesus Christ, his son. Amen. God is calling you to come. This table is open to all who are present. Come and receive. Jesus and I am the bread of life. Those that come to me shall never hunger, and those who believe in me shall never thirst. Arise and go in peace, and may the bread of heaven nourish your soul into everlasting life. Amen.
said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Arise and go in peace and by your fruits may all know that you are disciples of our Lord. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if anyone enters in, they shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Arise and go in peace, and in his service may you find perfect freedom. Amen. I am the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Arise and go in peace, and may the light of the world shine on your pathway and in your heart forever. Amen. Amen. 